Amen. Someone sang the song, it's the most wonderful time of the year, and I believe it is, but it is because of the attitude of the season, which is a giving attitude. I, I did announce that I would receive a love offering today for a family in this church. They're employed by this church. They're faithful as can be. We love them very much, but they've had two funerals, thousands of dollars of expense. They need groceries. Dad's out of work. He's got a broken arm. And uh, it's, it's serious business right now. And I probably could take 100 offerings today for 100 different people. But because it's Christmas, the whole essence of Christmas is giving. If you have nothing to give, don't, don't feel pressured. But we are receiving a love offering for the Flores family. And uh, I want to give because I want them to have a lot of mouths to feed and I want them to be blessed. And it's the spirit of Christmas. That's what Christmas is. Amen. So the ushers are going to receive this offering. Amen. Put this envelope in for me. And uh, I appreciate you if you're able to give to do something and bless another family. And think about if it was you I was receiving the offering for today, how would you feel? Would you want to be blessed? I know you would, and I know you'll respond for a great need. I'm going to bring your attention. They can go right ahead, right ahead and receive that, and it won't bother me a bit. I'm going, to, I'm going to bring your attention to Luke chapter 2 in the first seven verses. Luke chapter 2, first seven verses, and then we're going to read one verse from Jeremiah 29, 11. And I'm excited about God's word today and what he has to say to the church. Amen. Luke 2. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus. I'm going to stop right there and say if you were living in that time and somebody said a decree has just come out from Caesar Augustus, you'd shake a little bit in your boots and you'd feel the pressure and the stress that Caesar Augustus of Rome has just made a decree, especially this kind, that all the world should be registered and should be taxed. Does that sound familiar? The census first took place while Corinius was governor of Syria. I've heard a lot about Syria in the news lately. So everybody, the whole world, went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, a little tiny country town called Bethlehem because he was of the house and the lineage of David to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. And the first thing you think is this is Joseph and his betrothed wife, and she is carrying a child, and maybe Joseph's the father here. That's what you would think. So it was. While they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her first born son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Would you say praise the Lord? Jeremiah 29 and 11. One of the greatest verses in the Bible, especially the Old Testament. Jeremiah 29 11. God is speaking and he says, for I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not thoughts of evil. And he says in your Bible, for I know my plans. I know my plans for you. That's what I'm going to preach about this morning. The Lord speaking to you, the church, to you and I today, I know my plans for you. I know my plans for you. Turn to somebody and say, look at him, say, I know God's plans for you. Praise God. God's got a plan. 
Amen. And you may be seated. God bless you in the name of the Lord. Amen. This is my own message this morning, but I did hear a, a statement that caught my attention this week. And I'm going to open up with the statement that I heard because I liked it. The statement was that Larry King, who is a great talk show interpreter for decades, world known, Larry King was asked if you could interview anybody in the history of the world, of mankind, who was it that you would like to have interviewed that you didn't get a chance to? And Larry King said, I would like to have interviewed Jesus Christ. And they asked him why. And he said, because I'd like to look into his eyes and ask him this one question. Is it really true that your mother was a virgin and knew no man? and that you were born of her. He said, if Jesus Christ looked at him and said, yes, I was born of a virgin, it changes all of history and changes everything in the history of religion and salvation for this world. Can you say praise the Lord? The virgin birth of Jesus Christ is one of the greatest historical reality miracles of all time. And we've heard the acrostic of joy. I love the word joy. And uh, the acrostic, if you break it down, I'm sure you've heard it, is Jesus for J, others for O, and Y is for you. If you get Jesus first, others second, and then you last, you're going to have some joy. I meet a lot of unhappy people, and I meet happy people, unhappy people, happy people, and I meet joyous people. And uh, we start out in life as takers. That's how we are. My grandson turned two yesterday, and we went to Balboa Park with the whole family to celebrate his second birthday. And uh, he was the center of attention, which he feels that he is, little Gavin Elliott. And I noticed that as we got to the pizza place down in Plaza Bonita, uh, we took the time to say, here's your, here's your birthday gifts, and we bought him a little plastic golf bag. Everything was plastic, plastic golf clubs, plastic golf balls. He loves to hit a ball, and uh, the, the poor people in the pizza place had to put up with it. He pulled it out, so the only thing you want to do is put the ball down, start hitting it. But there's only a small vocabulary that comes out of him. His vocabulary is mine, mine, me, give me some candy. I don't know where he learned this. Give me a quarter. He knows that line because he knows a quarter will open a bubble gum machine. And uh, we're so used to it, we actually spent 19 bucks on a bubble gum machine and he got a bubble gum machine. He got his golf set and a bubble gum machine and he was very happy, but Everything was me, mine, give me. That's how we start out. We learn later in life that the happiest people on earth are the people that are givers. The month of December is really a, a month of giving. Now, I'm not even preaching on giving. I'm just making the statement about the spirit of December, the spirit of Christmas, the spirit of Jesus, of Mary, of Joseph, of the three wise men. It all centered around giving. It all centered around being not a Scrooge, but being a joyous person that loves to help people. Amen. They gave of themselves, which brings joy. When you give of yourself, you'll find you'll live in a lot of joy. And you're thinking about others, and you're not thinking about yourself. And God loves that spirit, and God loves that attitude, which we find in the December time. So as followers of Jesus Christ, we want to follow that pattern. We want to be happy, joyous givers in December. End strong. End in that positive way. Thinking about others. Hallelujah. That's why Jesus 
was on earth. Follow his pattern. He came for others. He came to save others. Amen. And so look at this event that I just read to you in Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. It's the greatest event in history. And the Bible says, a virgin brought forth her firstborn son. And they called his name Jesus. Now just stop right there for a moment and think about this. When Jesus was born in that manger in Bethlehem, in a barn basically, that is the moment the entire world changed the calendar. Right there, folks. It goes from A.D. to B.C. I mean, it goes from B.C. to A.D. He, it was before Christ, and now Jesus Christ has changed the entire calendar set in history. He changed the destiny of the world. He changed the destiny of Israel. He changed the destiny of every human being that would ever live. He changed the Roman Empire. It was all built on a Savior that came from our Lord and God. For God so loved the world that he gave. His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Look at this woman by the name of Mary. Some say she was just a little 16, 17-year-old girl. I want you to think about what Mary gave first. The first thing that Mary gave was her will. An angel appeared to her. It was one of the three archangels of all of heaven. It was God's inner circle. His name was Gabriel. She was face to face with Gabriel. She was looking into the eyes of Gabriel. And Gabriel told her the power of the Father, the power of the Holy Ghost is going to overshadow you. And you are going to be impregnated with a son. And he is going to be the most high. He's going to be the Messiah. He's going to be the king of kings. And she heard what Gabriel was saying to her. She had to give her will to God. That's so important that you give your will up to Almighty God. Lord, have thine own way. Here I am, Lord, body, soul, and spirit. I give myself away. I give myself away. I give myself to you. And here's the quote of Mary when she heard God's will being said to her by the angel Gabriel. She said, quote, I am the Lord's servant. Somebody just say that today. I am the Lord's servant. That's what you are. I am the Lord's servant and may it be unto me as you have spoken, Gabriel. May it be unto me to carry, which would be a very public shame for a while, which would be a burden to do the will of God. She gave up. Think about it for a moment. I've never preached about this side of it before. She gave up her will, which means she gave up her ambitions. She gave up her dreams. She gave up her rights. She gave up her, her plans. Every young lady has plans in their life. Praise God. Not only did she give up her will, I'd like you to think about this number two. She gave up her body. Now, a lot of people give up their body to different things, but she gave up her body to the Holy Ghost. She gave up her body to do the will of God. She gave up her body to do a most holy thing. Her physical body was impregnated, and she was a virgin. She's the only person. Now, now folks, there's been great people born like, like, the, like the prophet John. There's been different ones born in history, and they had miracle births, and they had miracle interpretations of their birth. But there has never been a living soul ever in this world that gave birth to a baby, and they were a virgin, and they did not have any relationship with a man. That's what makes this so exciting. If you don't believe in the virgin birth, you don't believe in anything. If you don't believe in the virgin birth, you have nothing to be excited about today she knew no man by giving up her virginity to God Almighty her temple can I say this the best possession 
of a woman is her own personal temple that she gives to a man. I want to walk on this lightly this morning. I don't want to offend anybody, but I want to say something to you. She gave up her own body to be used by the living God and have no pleasure with it. She knew who she was going to marry, Joseph. She was espoused to Joseph. He would be her husband for her life. Joseph would be her partner intimately. And she looked forward to the day that she and Joseph would be one. Can you understand what I'm saying? But she said, no, we're going to wait on the joy. We're going to wait on the experience. We're going to wait on our time personally together because I'm going to give myself to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Looking forward to Joseph, it was all put on hold to bear Jesus Christ. Joseph had to be a very unique human being. To understand that, number one, to wait for that, number two. And folks, if you don't understand biblical understanding of that hour, when you were a spouse to be married, it means you were already husband and wife. You just had not consummated your vows. That's what it meant. You're already looked at as married. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I got to tell you something. When that girl was PG with the Lord Jesus Christ in her body, you hear me. She had to say to her husband, listen, don't fall down, sit down. I want to tell you something. I'm carrying a baby and it's not yours. You're going to have to understand this. Oh, how did this guy understand? What are you talking about? You're my wife already, and she's carrying a baby. It had to be an angel that came to Joseph, and God sent an angel face to face and said, the woman that you're going to be marrying, it's okay, because that which is born in her is that of the Holy Lamb of God. Hallelujah. Clap your hands to the Lord for that. Praise God. Can you imagine your wife telling you that? And then she had to explain it. She had parents. He had parents. They had to explain it to the parents. They had to explain it to her best friends. They had to tell it to people. Now we're getting into trouble because here's where I'm going. I don't think you've ever heard this before, but I tell you what, I thought about this today. In that hour, if you were a spouse to a husband and you were going to be his partner and you were already espoused, If you were carrying a baby that was not of your husband, it was called adultery. And in that hour, you would be by the order of the law, be stoned to death. And the men that were known as the head of the synagogue would come after you like the FBI. And they would take you and drag you like a dog into the center of the market. And they would begin to bash your skull and your body and the fetus within you. They would kill you. Because you have committed adultery. Do you understand what Mary gave up? Do you understand what Mary was carrying in her soul? She gave up her reputation to carry the body of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Listen to me. First of all, it had to be a mystery to her. She couldn't understand everything. Secondly, it had to be a mystery to Joseph. And thirdly, it had to be a mystery to her own family. Oh, God, how did you come to church today? Did you ride a bike? Did you ride a skateboard? Did you ride a motorcycle? Did you have a car? Or did you walk to church? Did you take the bus? What kind of transportation did you take to church today? The woman was nine months with child and she had a ride a donkey. She was, I'm talking about a a woman with child. She's on top of a donkey. It wasn't two city blocks down to the local manger. They went from Nazareth down to Bethlehem, Judea. She was in the cold. She was in the rain. She was in the elements. Somebody get with me this morning and say, Praise God. She did that to bear that Savior. She did that to bring you, hallelujah, the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. She was a wonderful, wonderful young lady. Praise God. And so she 
She did more than we give her credit for. But every single thing that I preached about, God said, little lady, I got plans for you. I have plans for you. Do you know that there's not a person in here that your life don't count to God? And especially if you're in the sound of my voice this morning, it's absolutely, it's absolutely a fact of God that God is dealing with you and God is working with you and God is moving on you and God is calling you and God has a plan for you. God has big plans for you. Mary wasn't the only one. He's no respecter of persons. Hallelujah. The plan of God for you is a great plan. God's total, complete plan for you is a good plan. It's a righteous plan. It's a blessed plan. If you believe it, say amen. God doesn't give you junk when you serve him. God doesn't curse you when you serve him. I'm trying to show you God had a plan for Mary. God had a plan for Joseph. God had a plan for the shepherds. God had a plan for Caesar Augustus. God had a plan, and it's of goodness. Jeremiah 29, 11, our text. God has a plan in spite of how things may look in your life right now, however they look. God has a plan that's going to be fantastic. I run across far too many people, especially in 2013. Brother George, we run into people today that are just living hopeless. People whose lives are full of hopelessness. People who don't want to live. People who are just mainly existing. Am I ever going to get out of this mess? Am I ever going to be where God wants me to be? Will I ever get my life right and get it on track? Is there ever going to be a time where everything in my life is working out the right way? People losing their sense of hope. Now let me read the text again. Bring your mind into captivity. Those of you watching on the internet, listen to the word of the Lord. Jeremiah 29 11. God is speaking. Let God speak right into your spirit right now. For I know. The plan that I have for you, declareth the Lord. Plans of welfare, that means well-being. That means good stuff. When the Lord says welfare, it means well-being. I have plans for you. Plans of welfare. Plans of well-being. Plans that are good. Not. Somebody say not. Right there in the middle of the scripture. Not for calamity. Not for bad, not for evil, to give, to give, to give you a future, to give. Our God is a giver. What kind of a giver? He's a future giver. I want to tell you today, I don't care how old you are. I don't care what your age is. I don't care if you haven't reached your plan. God has never given up on you. And God plans to bless your future. And God plans to take you through. He that has begun a good work in you will fulfill it to the day of redemption. God always finishes what he started. He's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He finishes what he starts. Praise God. See that preacher back there? Wave your hand in the back row. Wave your hand this morning. Back row. That's you. God has great plans for you. One of those is you're preaching tonight at 5 o'clock. God's got great plans for you. Clap your hand to the Lord. Praise God. I believe what I'm preaching. I believe the word of God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. He declares, I will give you a future, not calamity, not bad, not evil. I will give you a future and give you a hope. Once God declares 
that I have plans for you, take it to the bank. Please note, again, hear it. Marinate it on your brain like a pickle jar. Hallelujah. I have good plans, not bad. I have positive plans. Hallelujah. Now, how does a human being lose hope? Let me tell you where this is. How do you live in this planet? Whatever you're going through, who's ever hurt you, whatever your children have done, whatever your grandchildren have done, whatever you're going through, how do you lose hope? You lose hope when you don't see much ahead in your future. When you feel like life has passed you by. When you think that your best days are behind you, the devil's a liar. He is a liar. You lose hope when you don't think you have much future in the kingdom, much future in God. And this wonderful verse, this glorious verse, this positive verse, this promise of God is written in one of the most horrible chapters in the Bible. It's a horrible chapter. It's all negative. It's all dark. It's all bad. It's not a good place to go verse searching. It's a great verse in a bad chapter. Say praise the Lord. So if you're having a bad life, if you're having a bad day, if you're having a bad December, if you've had a bad year, I want to tell you, you just found a good verse in a bad chapter. And I'm going to drive this verse home this morning. Let me, let's, let me just give you the background for a moment of the chapter Israel was in hopeless captivity. The Babylonians had come to Jerusalem and burned it down with fire. Now hang with me here. They burned it down. They took all the Jews into captivity. If you were a Jew, you were in Babylon. What did that mean? Verse 29 and 4. It says in Jeremiah 29, 4, thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all who were carried away. You know, people get carried away. To all who were carried away captive whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem to Babylon. Now, let me tell you something. There's times in our life that God deals with us. God will deal with us or God will allow fiery darts of the devil to attack us and tear us apart because he wants to remind us where the good stuff is. He wants to remind us who's in charge. He wants to remind us who to go to in prayer and lean on. So all the Jews, say all the Jews, they had got rebellious. Hello. They had backslid. Hello. No pastor relates to that in 2013. People getting rebellious. People backsliding. People quitting church. Man, hello. You know what? No matter what you're doing and where you are. God knows your frame. He remembers your dust. His mercies are new every morning. He is not finished with you. I want to tell you, God has big plans for you. God has good plans for you. Brother Larson, how do you know that? I'll tell you exactly how I know that. Look at me right now. I'll tell you how I know God has big plans for you. Number one, he don't lie. And number two, you're still here. Oh, Brother Larson, but I cannot handle that. Oh, Brother Larson, but don't say that to me. But Brother Larson, you don't know what I'm going through. You don't know what kind of a trial I'm in. You don't know what kind of a God I'm preaching about. You don't know what kind of a God I'm serving. You don't know what kind of a God is talking out of his word. You don't know he's not done with you. You're alive. You're alive. Paul spent time in prison. Disciples were crucified, boiled in oil, fed in the horrible pit of the lions. This wonderful verse, dear God have mercy. They went into exile because God said, I sent you there. I sent you there because you were in rebellion. 
When God sees our rebellion and our attitude, oh, don't you ever think he's given up and that we're just going to be like a peacock walking around and we don't need God anymore. There's coming a day. There's coming a time. You're going to fall into a pit and you'll be eating the juices of the pigs on their little old cobs. And you're going to say, what in the name of God have I ended up like this? I used to have money. I used to be blessed. I used to do this. I used to be known. And oh God, if I can just get back the father's house they were in rebellion under god's hand of discipline for what sins they were under the hand of god's discipline if you please they were being spanked by god now why am i talking about babylon it's not a place where christians hang out hey baby baby land baba land babylon is not for christians I want to tell you, it's a place where pagans lived. It was a city of pagans. It was a city and country that evil was as worse as it could get. Everybody that lived there was full of idolatry. They were terrible. They were godless. How bad can I make it? How real can I make it? This is where devout Jews, Hasidic Jews, Orthodox Jews, real Jews found their daily life style under the Babylonians. Again, now just for a moment, they were under judgment. Again, they were living in pagan prisons. Again, oh, I hate this part. I don't like this part. It says they were there because the preachers were false that led them astray. That tells me the preachers weren't preaching the word. You got to preach the word, preach the word, stay in the word. The preachers led them astray. Verse 29, eight of Jeremiah. How to listen. Don't, don't listen to the false dreamers. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets and your diviners who are in your midst deceive you, nor listen to your dreams which you cause to be dreamed. You've got to know the man of God, and by their fruits you shall know them. We don't judge one another, but God called us to be fruit inspectors. Check the fruit of your preacher. Don't listen to false dreamers. They give you false hope. Everybody say false hope. False preachers will give you false hope. And bless God if you give today, God's going to give you a brand new Cadillac. And God's going to give you a new home. If you give 10000 extra dollars, God's going to give you a new home. They, they, they prophesy falsely in the name of God. And Jesus said in the end time, say that's now. Jesus said in the end time that false Christ would appear who prophesy in the name of God in my name, he said, and give you false hope. So false prophecy preachers will tell you you're not going to have any trials. You're not going to have any tests. You're not going to go through hell on earth. There's no losses ahead. All going to be sweet and smooth and no rain and all sunshine. Oh, God. And then people find out it's all false. And they lose their faith and they lose their toehold and they go through a living hell because there's situations that happen in life. And if you have no hope this morning, Brother Joe, I want to tell you from circle of circumference, from the pulpit to right where you're standing, I want to tell you that if you do not have any hope, you're living empty on this planet. You're just existing. You're just going through the motions and you're living with pain. I came up in the greatest era of cars in history, the muscle cars. 357 Chevys, 442s, giddy up, giddy up, 409. Everybody had their car and their road runners. And I I mean, it was in the 50s, man. They would put the the glass packs and and the fuel injection and, and dual quads and the big tires. And oh, everybody loved fixing their cars. Hallelujah. Now we drive Fords, fix or repair daily because we have to do it. Praise God. But let me tell you, those were the days when people had their own custom made car and they fixed it up. I don't know whatever happened to that era, but I will tell you one thing. When you were born, whatever the date of your birth is, and you can fill it in. If you're still breathing and you're alive, God has made you a customized job. God is working on you. God has planned a great, great, great 
great, great future for you. I promise you. I'm telling you. I stand on the word of God. Nobody has fingerprints like you have. You're the only one with a set of fingerprints. There's no snowflake that's like another snowflake. Your DNA is like nobody else's. You're completely, completely, totally a package of yourself alone. And God has great plans for you. God has great plans for you. God has a great future for you. Jesus told us about the hour we'd be living in. Life has times of aimlessness. But I know the plans I have for you. There's times everybody can look back in their life when they were meandering. There are times you can look back in your life when you were wandering. There are times you can look back in your life where you were plainly aimless and God wasn't in a million miles of your thoughts. You don't know where you are. You didn't know why you were going through what you were going through. You had no direction and you were on a journey passing time and spinning your wheels and you got confused and the government messed up and the country messed up and the Babylonians messed you up and preachers who were false messed you up and you said, hey God, are you even there? I want to end it all. I don't like me and I don't like my life. I just want to end it all. God, are you really there? Will you help me? God, let me just tell you, we're messed up. God, I'm ticked off. I'm ticked off how life has turned out. God, I'm ticked off by the rebellion. Hallelujah, in the first place. What can I do today? God, what can I do? What, is, what, what does this mean? When I read to you, what does it mean, folks? I know the plans I have for you. And they are not bad. They are good. Why is that important? Somebody shout at me, important. That is so great because God has plans for you. You're here. God wants to right the wrongs. God plans on operating in your life. Now, the first thing people confess to me as a pastor is they say, you don't know how bad my past is. Dear God, have mercy. People are hung up on their past. Brother Larson, did you ever do anything wrong in your past? I did terrible things in my past. That's why you can repent of your sins today. We have a Father. We have a merciful God. If I confess my sins, he's faithful and just to forgive me. You can be baptized in Jesus' name, and every sin you've ever committed will be washed. You can get under the blood today. Somebody that believes it, clap your hands to the Lord and say amen. I don't care how bad your past is. I don't care how bad your past is. I don't care how horrible your past is. All I know is with God saying today, I know I have great plans for you. God is a God of the future. God is a God of today. He's got plans for you. Everybody say faith has, to grow. faith has to grow. Now you listen to me. Faith grows the best in the dark. You ever had a night that you wish to God you didn't have to get up the next day? Anybody? You ever had a night that was so long that you knew tomorrow was going to bring a hell on earth to you? The night is where your faith grows. You can't sleep. You're mentally fatigued. You're out of your mind with worry and concern and fear. You're in the dark. You don't know everything going on. You're struggling. You're in the night. I don't know what's going to happen. I can't see what's happening. I can't figure things out. I can't see God moving. I'm in this terrible night. I, I can't sleep. I'm dreading the day. And God is saying... I know something you don't know. 
I know something you don't know. I have good plans for you. It may be a long night, but I have good plans for you. Somebody say praise the Lord. But it seems so dark. It seems so lonely. It seems so cold. Hold on. Hold on. Just hold on to God's unchanging hand. Seek the Lord. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Hold on. Because when God moves, you're going to know he moved. You're going to see it. And you're going to say, why was I so worried about that? Why did I let that bother me so bad? Because I know the plan. Details are always obscure. You just don't see the details in the dark. It's dark. You'll break your toe in the dark. I've done it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Weeping May. Even the month of May is only 30 days long. Weeping May endure for a night. But joy cometh. In, am I getting to anybody here today? Who's God talking to? Who's God speaking to? I know my plans. Look at the hints of the information here. First, there was plans for welfare. He said, I'm going to make sure of your welfare. I'm going to take care of you. No calamity. I'm going to bless you. He said in the plans, in the, in the scripture, I read it to you. He said, I, it involves your future and your tomorrow. God has already, oh God have mercy. God Almighty is so great. He has already scoped out the week for you. This Christmas week, what is today? December what? That's what I thought. December 15th to December, hallelujah, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, right to Christmas. God's already scoped up the week. God's already been there. God's already been to Thursday. God's already been to next Sunday. God says, I've gone ahead. I've checked it out. I've got good plans for you. Hallelujah. You're not always going to be weeping. And he comes back and says, just hold on a little bit longer. Verse 5 says, uh, just keep working. Look at verse 5. Keep working. Jeremiah 29. I know my plans for you. Everybody say, keep working. keep working. The Bible says, occupy till I come. Keep testifying. Keep praying. Keep fasting. Keep believing. Keep coming to church. Keep giving to God. Keep giving the Lord your time. Keep anointing, hallelujah, somebody's life. Keep loving people. Just hold on. It's going to get good. Hallelujah. He said, praise God in verse number five, Je Jeremiah 29, five, he says, work and plant your gardens, eat, maximize your potential, maximize your potential while you're waiting on God. I don't know who came up with it, but I like it. Carpe diem, carpe diem, seize the day. Seize the day while you got it. Hallelujah. Seize the moment. Occupy till I come. Ch chapter 29 verse 7 says, do not decrease. Seek the welfare of others. Somebody say others. Be a blessing to others. He said, multiply. Be fruitful. Seek the welfare of the city. Seek the welfare of others. Are you being a blessing to somebody else? Are you being a blessing at Christmas time? If you are, if you're being a blessing to somebody else at Christmas time, if you are, you're setting yourself up to the greatest blessing. The greatest blessing. Because the Lord loves it when you reach out to those that cannot help themselves. We lose hope in this world. Stay with me right now. We lose hope in this world. When we get our eyes off of being concerned about others, when it's all about Frank Sinatra's my way, me, myself, and I, is when you get messed up and all you think about is you, you will do what you want to do. It's the opposite of Christmas. It's the opposite of the Spirit. Where is your focus? God expected Israel to come out of Babylon because... They were out of help, and he was the only one that could help them. Second Chronicles 7, 14, looking for the solution today. If my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray. Somebody say, seek my face. 
and seek my face. Then will I hear from heaven, and I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. Don't look for your plans. God has the right plans. Look to God. Go to God. Submit yourself like Mary to God, and God's plans are amazing. I'm telling you, the most faith in your life is going to grow in the dark. I'm going to tell you that again. I'm winding down, but I want to tell you that, that the Bible says God took Adam and put him into a deep sleep. He put Adam in a deep sleep. What did he do? The Bible says he opened up his side. Everybody say his side. That's what the scripture says. So look up the word side. It said it, it opened up his ribs. Now we always mention that God took out a rib, but when God opened up his side, he opened up a rack of ribs. He opened up his side. Praise God. And the Hebrew word rib means side. Now, Adam is half the man he was because God's taken out his side. And God fashioned. God fashioned from the ribs. God fashioned a woman. Oh, my God. When God made Eve, he did it in the dark. When God gave Eve to Adam, he was asleep. God fashioned a woman from a rib, and the Hebrew word fashion means to build. So God built a woman to complement a man as no other species can, to be his blessing, to be his wife, to be his pleasure, to be the mother of his children. And that's God's plan as a man and a woman, folks. Sorry to disappoint you. Hallelujah. To do God's plan of a society. This ought to get you excited today. God literally came up with a plan of ideal specifications in every detail for that guy. Note something. The Bible says God brought her to Adam. She knows nothing. She was a thought one moment. She was a rib. She's a woman. God makes her out of a rib. Come with me, Eve. Eve brings, God brings Eve to Adam. Listen to me. And the only one that she's known to this point is her creator. She now meets the male species. God is the matchmaker. Get it. God made a man for a woman and a woman for a man. God is the matchmaker. God has the plan. And Adam goes, Whoa, man! And God had a woman because it's God's best work when you're asleep in the dark. God is working on the scenes. Just like that story, God is working for you. Say, God is working for me. In all your questions, God has a plan. In all of your frustration, God has a plan. The scripture says, he that has begun a good work in you shall perform it until the day of redemption. What God starts, he's going to finish. Let me wind down. Get to the music. Get the singers behind me. Let me wind down here. Pastor, do you understand what I'm going through? Listen, God has a plan for you. It's not a calamity. It's the best plan on earth. Let me wind down and just say God had a plan for everybody in the Christmas story. He had a plan for Mary. Look how he used Caesar. I read it to you. Come on out here, folks. Stay looking at me. He told Caesar because Caesar thought he thought it up. Listen to me. Caesar thought he thought it up. And God put it in his brain. I'm going to send out a decree and a census. And where was Mary and Joseph? They were in Nazareth. We got to get them to Bethlehem and fulfill 700 years of prophecy from Micah. And so Joseph put his wife, who was with child by the Holy Ghost, on a, be burst, a beast of burden, a donkey, and they went down into Bethlehem. A census, a tax, return to your homes. 
God put it in that emperor's head to get the Messiah to Bethlehem, and he didn't even know he was being used. Joseph takes them to the Hilton, the Hyatt, Motel 6 was even full. There was no room in the inn. My wife's giving birth right now. Do you understand? It's cold. It's night. We have a stable. Think of that. Does it ever get old to you? Are you so bored you can't wait for your bologna sandwich? Just think. The, when the Bible says she brought forth her firstborn son and laid him in a manger with swaddling clothes. Do you know what the manger was? Don't make it pretty, folks. It was the food trough. It was the seed trough. And Mary and Martha, excuse me, Mary and Joseph, look down and see the baby in that horse trough. And guess what happens? God Almighty had plans. He sent a star like no other star in history and put it over that stable. And people who are so insignificant in the minds of people, the commoners were the shepherds, and all of a sudden the heavens open up like a mighty, glorious light. And the angels appeared by the millions and said, Glory to God in the highest, peace on earth, goodwill among men for unto you is born this day in the city of David isn't God great with his planning and you know what the shepherds did stand to your feet folks just enjoy this last minute and a half the shepherds said let's get out of this barn and this pasture and let's go to where that star is and the Bible said the shepherds got there first they got to where the young child was and they were amazed they were filled with wonder I have plans, buddy. And then there were three wise guys. If you study it out, they were Persians and they came from Persia. They traveled all the way from Persia to Bethlehem. And when they went through the land, the king said, I like you guys. I really love you guys. When you find where the child is, will you let me know? I want to come worship him too. And when they walked in there and saw who that king was, he was the king of kings and the Lord of lords. They understood by the star and the angels. You talk about plans. You know what the first thing they did? They gave gold, frankincense, and myrrh at the horse trough. Do you think Joseph and Mary could afford the Hilton the next night? I'll tell you what, they could stay anywhere they want in town. They got gold. Oh, God knows how to plan my future. Hallelujah. I might be living in a hovel. I might be in a manger right now. But God knows my future. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You're custom made. Praise God. Praise God. What a story. Bethlehem of Judea. A woman who was a virgin brought forth the Son of God. Hallelujah. Some folks in closing, let me just say this to you. Some folks think that that's where Jesus started. Is that crazy? Oh, that's the plan of God. That's when a baby was born, they call him Jesus, and, and he's the second person in the triune Godhead. That's where it all... Folks, Jesus was there from the beginning. When we get to heaven, we're going to see one on the throne. His name is Jesus. Every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. He's not junior in the Trinity. He's my Lord and my God. He that has seen the Father has seen me has seen the Father. Oh, let's end this service today with a Christmas spirit. Come on down and let's sing. Come on down.